I'm Charlotte McLeod with the Investing News Network, and here today with me is David H. Smith, Senior Analyst at the Morgan Report and partner at the Load Cryptographic Silver Project. Just a reminder before we get started that if you enjoy this interview, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. David, thank you so much for being here online with me today. It's good to be speaking with you again, Charlotte. I always enjoy these discussions. Yeah, it's good to be back with you. And I'm gonna start by talking about something we discussed in our last interview, which was, I think uh, this past September, we were talking then about the $30 per ounce mark as kind of a resistance point for silver. And that still seems to be true even months after that point. So to begin, I wanted to ask you about what it is about that level that seems to stop silver in its tracks. What are you seeing there? Well, first of all, it's a round number, which always has an effect. Also, it's kind of an area just below $30 is where the, uh, the, the impulse leg of last year stopped. I think it was in early August. So it's been almost a year. It's been longer than people expected. And that's proven to be more of a of a difficult area to break through than people imagine. But I think that area is getting long on the truth and I uh, on the tooth. And I wouldn't expect it to hold up too much longer as we move into the fall and, and after Labor Day for sure. Yeah, and one thing I think that I've heard people talk about when they speak about that $30 level is when you take premiums into account, people are actually already paying more than $30 for an ounce of silver. So how do you rec reconcile that resistance point with the fact that people are actually willing to pay more? Well, the premium, of course, has to do with real life uh, supply and demand, uh, the physical metal, and the $30 uh, level on the chart is a paper level where the, the futures contracts have been trading. So uh, you have a kind of a two tiered situation, so to speak. You have a pretend level on the charts, uh, and then you have the real level where you and I have to go buy physical silver, pay uh, a price that is determined by the market demand. And that, as you mentioned, uh, these, the, the prices are quite a bit higher than that in certain situations, for example, for American Silver Eagles, it could be in the mid to high 30s. Uh, and in basic uh, bullion coins and bars, uh, it could be 32, 33, you know, right in that area. So, um, but, but people look at the charts and when they say, well, when it breaks 30, that means something big is going on. So uh, once those sell stops get hit and people have to reverse because people that have futures contracts have to offset if they're short at that level, then the fireworks begin, and I think we'll see a very uh, interesting level between 30 and 50 going on once this finally breaks, which I anticipate as being very possible. Uh, I would expect sometime after Labor Day, if not before. Yeah, and we'll we'll talk a little bit more about the silver price as we get further on in the interview. For now, I want to talk a little bit more about retail uh, demand for silver, which of course was very high at the beginning of the year when we started to have the silver squeeze going on. What's it looking like to you right now? Well, the people I speak with, the retail demand has remained robust and the premiums have come down a little bit, but there's still buying going on. And this pattern that we've developed over the last year and a half of when prices drop people buy and when they rise, people buy. So this, this shows that there's demand out there going on all the time. And, you know, the Wall Street bets people uh, have been helpful in this regard. There are a lot of people that have been introduced to the silver story that had not been before. And they realized the importance of buying physical rather than paper ETFs. So this is a change that's going on under the hood that I think will make the next impulse like quite robust when silver does break out. So uh, it's going to be pretty exciting. And of course, the mining stocks have held up pretty well, too, as well. Right. And of course, silver is not just a precious metal. It's also an industrial metal. And people like to talk about those two sides of its demand. What are you seeing on the industrial side there, just so we don't forget what's happening in that part of the market? Well, as we, as we come back from the COVID issue, or becoming less of an issue, People are getting back into normal buying habits and they're also 
the supply line is getting rebuilt again as well, too. So industry is stepping up and buying more silver. But as David Morgan mentioned recently, the uh, the investment demand is exceeding silver uh, handily, which it had not done for a long, long time. And if you look at the buying in India, uh, the, some of the largest amount of buying in India in the last couple of years is taking place buying physical silver right now. And of course, they can buy up to 30 or 40 percent of the annual production of silver. So uh, things are getting uh, the pipeline is getting pretty interesting. And traditionally, uh, the difficulty has been to ramp up for that increase in demand when it comes in a way that is a bit surprising. So that's I think that's where we're going to be headed on the next leg up. Right, and let's talk a little bit more about the supply side because as people probably know, a lot of silver is produced as a byproduct of other metals. I know you've been doing some research on how copper supply and silver supply may be linked looking into the future. So maybe you could tell me what you've seen there, what you're looking at. Yes, uh, about 70% of the silver comes from byproduct, uh, as a byproduct of copper, lead, zinc, uh, deposits and many of these companies are quite large and it's it's not a big deal to them and so uh, but it's a big deal to us but what's been happening there recently is that the grades of these uh, deposits have been going down across the board the grades of copper uh, the grades of silver and this is also true of the primary silver producers they're having to dig up more ore and they're getting less silver out of them there haven't been any real large discoveries in recent years and this is going to go forward as we see the crunch going on with the EV uh, electric, uh, electronic vehicle uh, mass movement forward in the uh, green movement and uh, you know carbon, uh, carbon uh, deposit concerns and whatnot. And so I wrote an article recently, which has been very well received. I don't think too many people have been considering a couple of the things I discussed. And it has to do with the fact that copper is in great demand and will be probably for the next 15 to 20 years for all these different applications. And the big discoveries like silver are not being found. The ones that are out there producing are seeing lower grades and they're coming to some of the end of their mine lives. And uh, so the, the assumption is there'll be new uh, copper deposits coming on board. And when that happens, there'll be a lot of new silver since so much of it is a byproduct of copper production. But my premise is that there won't be that many deposits coming on because they take a long time to get to the production stage. If you discover a copper deposit, and it needs to be a large one to pay off, it can take 15 to 20 years or more to get that from the uh, pre-feasibility stage to getting actually the two to three billion dollars necessary to, to get up into a productive mode. And so those things are going to be coming online less frequently because many of them in, are in uh, country risk locales uh, that are questionable now with higher taxes and uh, social governance issues. And there are going to be less copper deposits coming on stream over the next 10 to 15 years than many people realize. And some of the big ones, such as the one uh, that Robert Friedland, he's got a couple of these going on in the DRC. These are massive copper deposits. But from my research, and I stand to be corrected on this, but I don't see that there's a lot of silver involved in these particular copper deposits. So they're not going to contribute a whole lot to the silver deficit uh, that we've been seeing over the last few years as their copper comes on stream. And they're producing very high grade, very pure copper. Uh, and it will help the copper si supply situation, but in no way is it going to fill that gap. So we're going to have an, an issue going on for a long time of trying to get more copper and and con commitment without trying to get more silver. That's really interesting. And that's kind of the first that I've been hearing about that potential situation. Maybe you could also touch on new sources of primary silver, which we know primary silver mines are rare, rare as it is. I'm assuming they're only going to get rarer now that you know we have declining grades, fewer discoveries. But what are your thoughts there? There are several uh, nice projects going along in Mexico, uh, one of which will be producing later this year, uh, Mag Silver. It's going to be, it'll probably equal First Majestic in terms of its output, and that's important, but it's, it's, it's going to be a stopgap measure. It's not going to turn the supply deficit around for silver, which has been 
getting larger over the last four to five years. There are other uh, juniors that are, are working on projects which may come online over the next two or three years. But some of the biggest projects out there uh, aren't gonna come on for a long time, if ever. And I mentioned several of them in my article, one of which is Pascualama on the Argentine-Chilean border, which looks like it's been shut down permanently, legally by the Chilean courts. And that would have been 25 million ounces a year going uh, into streaming uh, through Barrick. Also, there's the Navigad project, which is a 700 million ounce resource in Chubut province which has been forestalled for a number of years due to the issue of using cyanide. Even if that started uh, and got approval today, it could take at least five years to bring that online. And then there's a, a big one, which silver is a lesser component, but still significant. The Pebble Project in Alaska, which is really a copper, uh, a massive low-grade copper, gold, uh, silver molly project, which has been attempted for a number of years with several big uh, majors putting several hundred million dollars into it and walking away because of the complexity of it. But it's right in the middle of the largest uh, sockeye spawning salmon area in the world. And it has had a tremendous amount of pushback from the locals and from environmentalists and uh, has had some other issues regarding the way it's been proposed to the legislative bodies recently. So whether that ever gets permitted is problematic. And I think that is a long shot at best. So these really big projects that we do know about uh, seem to be far off in the distance if indeed they ever get going. And speaking a little bit more about the silver companies, have they been performing as you would expect with the metal at these levels? How do you see it? Well, you know, we kind of hoped and expected they'd be a little stronger than there, but we're in the summer gold rooms and usually that secondary low for the summer comes right in about now. So they have been holding up pretty well, all things considered. And when people come back to traders from Europe and whatnot after Labor Day, you know, a lot of participants just aren't at, in the market right now. And usually that is when you see the stronger pickup for both gold and silver prices. So people that are kind of giving up now are going to be selling into weakness and they're going to try back as things get stronger into the fall. And so uh, we're pretty optimistic about things. And one of the things that, uh, and that we probably won't have time to touch about it too much today, but I think that if a person puts together a portfolio after they get their physical silver, which you should always buy the physical bullion first in your investment program. And then if you have an appetite for greater risk and a little more uh, funds that can be risked, go into the mining sector and buy some junior miners, gold and silver. But by doing that, uh, not only uh, buying the, the gold and silver miners, but maybe pick up one or two really good uranium plays that you've researched and one or two good copper plays. This sort of thing adds some variety to your portfolio. And it will, it, as David Morgan says, it will be less likely to wear you out or scare you out when we go through the types of declines that we've seen, we saw a pretty good bump earlier in the year and then that disappointed people. So if you have silver as maybe a significant component, but not the only one of your portfolio, then you'll be seeing copper moving up when silver's quiet and you'll be seeing uranium moving up when, when copper's quiet. And you'll have this kind of a profit uh, coming back in your way on different things that will keep you in the game and keep you more calm than if you were a, uh, kind of a one trick pony, so to speak, where everything you hoped and, and prayed for depended upon a specific move in the silver price at a certain time. Yeah, great point. Never, never good to get too focused on one thing. We've been speaking quite a bit about silver supply and demand, which is of course important. I wanted to ask if you, when you look at the silver market and you're looking at where it may go, are you also paying attention to things like what the Fed is saying about inflation or interest rates, what the US dollar is doing? Did those elements play a big role in, in your thoughts? They really do. And they're not uh, uh, tactical trading decisions, but they're strategic considerations. The Fed uh, raising their lower in lowering interest rates and talking about that, and they're really in a position where they can't raise rates very much. But uh, it's obvious that they want to talk down the dollar uh, so that they can pay off the massive debts that the government has run up in uh, cheaper inflated dollars. So they'll talk one game and do another. So it's always important to listen to what they have to say. But 
uh, it seems like they really are a lot less uh, clued in about what's really going on on Main Street than the rest of us are. They claim that inflation is not that high, that it's a little high right now, but it's transitory. And a lot of things are just going to be taken care of when the pipeline gets filled. But what we have to pay for every day with food going through the roof and rent prices going up and real estate continuing strong and, and service sector uh, continuing to remain strong uh, and the backlog and shipping, all of these things are creating what uh, I believe is a perfect storm for inflation that it's going to be much higher than most of the people that are investing today have experienced. Now, David Morgan and I have been investing. We started our careers. We didn't know each other then, but we started our careers in the 1970s. And we lived through something called stagflation, where you had fairly low uh, economic considerations, but uh, relatively high uh, inflation, where we paid uh, more for just about everything. And that caused, at the end of that decade, it caused one of the biggest booms in history in gold and silver and and, and uh, currencies like the Swiss franc, and of course, very high interest rates. So uh, gold and silver can flourish in a high interest rate environment. It doesn't have to be low, uh, but right now it is low and the, interest, the real rates uh, are much different from what, what uh, the market perceives. So uh, gold and silver should, should do well no matter what happens, but I think you're gonna see higher inflation than people expect. And people get it now because more and more they're paying the higher price without complaining. They just kind of have a sense that if they want it, they're going to have to pay for it. And uh, that's going to make inflation go up even higher as demand you know, pursues that. So I think we're in for times that are more productive uh, for people in the metals and miners than uh, has been the case even going uh, since 2000 when they've had very robust returns to boot. Right. And I remember that your long term price outlook for silver is in the triple digits, I believe. Again, looking a little bit shorter term, where do you see silver going in 2021? Do you think we're going to break out of this, this range that we're stuck in at the moment? I think we will break out of the range. Whether we go up to $50 is problematic. There are people that I really respect that think that's a very real possibility this year. And the thing is, no one can predict this sort of thing in terms of timing or even speed. But what tends to happen is when a major resistance area in silver is broken, and it tends to lag a gold move, when that happens, then the pyrotechnics get started. And a lot of people will look at further resistance levels, and they'll try to tend, take profits when those levels are hit. But silver likes to slice through those levels. So predicting that is real difficult. And I think people would do well to decide what it is they want to hang on to uh, you know, over the intermediate to longer term and not get caught up in the idea of blowing out their positions because a certain level looks like it's going to hold the prices when it really doesn't. That's what happened to people when they thought 18 to 19 dollars would hold things. And it shot through that over a year ago and then went up into the mid to the high 20s. So nobody had been expecting that. And a lot of profit was left on the table by people that sold too soon. So uh, if you let Mr. Market talk to you rather than trying to tell it what to do, chances are you'll hold on to and make greater profits both in the physical and in the miners than if you tried to get too cute. Right. And for you, is this a good buying level that we're at right now? Because I know people might be tempted to wait and see if we have one of those falls back down to a lower level before they decide to get in. I think it is a good level. It's not, it's not the uh, best level you could have had in the last year for sure. But the thing is, the premiums can go through the roof when the supply gets tight, which can happen very quickly. So people have done this before. They said, well, silver is $26. If it goes to 22, I'm going to buy. Well, and if it does go to 22, chances are the premium will be $4 higher. So they might end up paying $32 for their $22 silver. And this happened when silver dropped to $12 last year. People were paying eight or $10 for silver uh, premium, even though it showed $12 on, on, the, uh, on the paper price. And I wrote an article for this, an essay for the Prospector News a couple months ago, uh, stating the fact that it's not sensible to wait for lower prices. And I spelled that C-E-N-T-S-A-B-L-E, -E, meaning that you'll actually pay more by waiting for lower prices when those premiums get stiffer. And that's what's happened to a lot of people in the past. So if you're ready to buy, you have the money, your dollar cost average, it fits your plan, 
now is as good a time as any, especially when the market is relatively quiet. You don't want to try to buy when there's a lot of excitement and volatility on because you will pay more and you'll have a harder time finding it. Okay, definitely great points. As we wrap up, I want to ask if you have any final points that you would leave the audience with and perhaps let us know where we can find you if we want to learn more from you. You bet. You know, there's one project that we didn't mention today that David Morgan and I and others have been involved with for over four years now. It's called the Load Cryptographic Silver Project. And this project has gone from being a long shot to actually the creation of a monetary system with a lot of different uses for silver that can be stored, can be spent, uh, now trading on an exchange, one of probably several coming up with uh, hotbit.io. And so it has a liquidity factor going on now. It's a digital silver coin backed by silver, AGX coin. There's also a, 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 a token, a load token, which serves as the background for uh, creating the silver mass. And it's experiencing a great deal of interest right now. And so we uh, have been supportive of this with our own writing about it and we are invested in it. And I think it's going to be as it builds itself out and a number of others have tried to do this with uh, modest success, but as this becomes more well known, I think it could become a supply factor that is discounted or not even expected by the market as more and more people realize that they can put uh, their money into a, a silver backed digital coin and have it stored several places in the world securely uh, and, and buy this in a competitive manner and, and be able to retrieve it if and when they want to or spend it. And this is an idea that's been long, long overdue. Others have tried to bring silver back in some form as part of the monetary mass. And uh, we now seem to be on the cusp of being able to do that. So I, I think that we're gonna be very excited to be a part of this and following it going forward from, from here on in. Anybody that would like to write to me about silver in general or in particular, or the mining stocks, I can't give financial advice, but I'm happy to offer opinions and offer some sources and whatnot. And quite a few people have done this already, as I've mentioned this on other uh, talking venues, can write to me at David S at load.one, that's L-O-D-E dot O-N-E. And I'll be happy to do what I can to get you on the right track and expand your thinking a little bit. Uh, and you can even sign up for David Morgan's free weekly letter, if you like, by uh, writing to support at the Morgan Report. And it doesn't cost you anything. So hopefully we can give back and help others uh, for the silver story, which I think is going to be immensely exciting uh, over, the, over the next coming months and years. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for giving that offer. Very, very nice to let people reach out. I hope that people will take advantage of that. And thank you as well for, for coming on to talk about silver and let us know what's going on in the market. You're welcome, Charlotte. And thank you for the work that you do. You know, I have watched you uh, grow uh, professionally over the last few years. I remember the first time you interviewed me was at its Frost <laughs> Conference. And it may have been one of your first interviews, I'm not sure, but you were kind of tentative, but I knew that you had a lot of potential. And I, I'm so happy to see you build that out. And from what I can see, you're one of the most highly respected uh, interviewers in our space now, and, and I expect that to continue. So kudos to you. Oh, well, thank you so much. What a wonderful compliment and a great note to end on. Once again, I'm Charlotte McLeod with the Investing News Network, and this is David H. Smith.